Good morning, Advent Church. Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, and can be found on page 961 in the Pew Bible. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of dust, sawdust in your brother's eye, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if ask for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law of and the prophets. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of this word. Amen. Good morning, everybody. We have... Uh, we continue to work on the Disciples' Prayer, <clears throat> as was mentioned a few weeks ago, and today is kind of a follow-up to the Disciples' Prayer, it's called Character and Conduct. If you listen to the Lord's Prayer and believe in the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, and want to follow it, then you have to listen to what was just read. Judge not, lest you also be judged. Uh, don't look at somebody's speck in your eyes when you got a plank in your own eye, and so forth. Those are restrictions, if you will, to what Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer. If you're going to follow the Lord's Prayer, then you can't do all this judgmental stuff. So how do we pray, and what does it mean? Uh, Our character says, I'm a Christian, and I pray, but my conduct says, I'm not sure that I ought to pray at this time or that time, or how to pray for this person. For example, when I was uh, a youth pastor in a large church, <clears throat> an elderly woman at the time I was in my 30s, she was in her 80s, and she went to the hospital to have double cataract surgery. Now back those days, 50 some years ago, about oh, 40 some years ago, um, she was laying on her back for three days and had these aluminum or silver plates over her eyes. She couldn't move from her back, couldn't open her eyes for three days. Those days are gone now as far as surgery goes for the cataracts. But she was laying there, and she sort of knew who I was, but she was trying to picture me with her eyes closed, and you're the young pastor at the church, aren't you? And, you know, and we talked a little bit, and I said, can I pray for you? And she said, well, maybe I should pray for you. <laughs> What would you think if you're 30 something and an 80 year old something laying on her back with her eyes closed, can't open them, thinks you need a prayer more than she does when she just had surgery and I didn't? I didn't know how to take that, but I thought to myself, what have I done wrong? What have I done to offend her? What have I done that she can judge me that I need prayers? Well, she's a most beautiful prayer. Nothing about who I was or my evil thoughts or patterns or whatever, but a prayer of thanksgiving for a young pastor who was out tending to his sheep. And then I gave a prayer for her after that, and it was a beautiful time. So how do you know when to pray and what to pray for? Or what would you do if somebody said, well, maybe I should pray for you instead of you pray for me? It kind of set me back and probably would set you back too. Another occasion, even younger, than, earlier than that, there was a man in his 70s confined to his bed because he had a couple of strokes and he couldn't move his legs, he couldn't move his arms. He was pretty much paralyzed from the neck down. His wife, according to him, when I visited him on different occasions, he would say, 
my wife tortures me so much. She takes my fingers and bends them back so they touch my wrist. Now, I can't get anywhere near that. I can imagine how hard that must have felt. One finger after another. And he said, then she takes my toes and bends them back too. And I can't do anything to stop her, but it hurts. And can you pray for me? So we prayed with him and for him. And I called the children who were in a different state and uh, told them what his mother was doing, what their mother was doing to their father. And they said, oh, my mom would never do that kind of stuff to dad. He's, he's hallucinating. Well, he had bruises. He had broken fingers and broken toes. But I couldn't convince the children down the road that he was being tortured. His mother, their mother, was in the stage of Alzheimer's. We didn't know the word at that time. But she was in that. She didn't know she was hurting him. She was just doing what she thought was right to do, exercising his fingers and his toes. We didn't know what to do when the children wouldn't listen to what was going on. Even when they came to visit, they said, Mom doesn't do that. We watched her. She's, she didn't touch him. So I couldn't interfere with anything. But I said, I can pray for you and for all of you. So it's a cautious prayer of what to do in a situation like that. One day, he ended up in the hospital. He was going to have a gallbladder operation. And the doctor said, it should be no problem. He's healthy otherwise, and there should be no problem at all. He'll be back home in a couple of days. I went to the hospital that night to pray with him before the surgery the next morning. And he said, I said, would you like me to pray with you? He said, I sure would. And he said, I want you to pray that I don't make it through the surgery. I'm not taught to pray that way, are you? <laughs> to pray for somebody to die on the, surger on the surgery? But I didn't know what to do, but I talked to him a little bit about life and death, and, and then he said, I do wish I wouldn't have to go through this. So I prayed a cautious prayer, and I said, you've heard this man's voice and his desires. And then I thought of the Lord's Prayer, and I said, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So it's kind of like, it's in your hands, Lord. Take over. But well, next morning, I got a call from the family that he went through surgery just fine. I said, hmm, <laughs> what do you do? I prayed. He prayed. He didn't get his wishes. About two hours later, they called and said, I don't know what happened, but he died. I said, okay, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. He had enough suffering. He wanted to go with you, and you allowed that to happen. So I began to focus on prayer in a different way than I had in years before that. The prayer that comes to my mind is always the Lord's Prayer. Pray that thy will be done, not my will be done. Thy, our, Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This first time in the Bible, the first time in the world, did anybody call God Father. The Jews knew about God, the, the great God up in the sky or somewhere, but they never thought of God as Father. But Jesus said, he's my Father, and you are adopted sons and daughters, and therefore you are children of God as well. He is your Father. So we have that prayer, and our character says, nevertheless, your will, not my will, be done. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, not my will. We know the prayer. We can all recite it very easily. But do we conduct ourselves in the way that the prayer asks us to? We assume that we know the Lord's Prayer because it's prayed so often in every worship service, almost, and also in the daily prayers of many individuals. I don't go to bed without praying the Lord's Prayer. I've heard many people tell me that because Jesus said, whenever you pray, make sure you pray like this. Pray our Father who art in heaven. Whatever else you pray for, pray for that. Even in light of humorous stories, like the fact that throughout childhood I thought deliver us from evil meant that Satan himself had made me in a place in my mother's womb. I don't know where I got that, but somewhere I felt that born in sin, probably because of the old saying that the sins of the fathers and fathers before you, we are, uh, we are born into sin. But when you listen to that prayer and listen to what Jesus had to say, we're not born into sin, but we have sin around us if we decide to go for it. It's easy to forget that the prayer was first given to the church in the larger context of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus went up there to be alone, but his disciples followed him, and the crowds followed him, and all of a sudden he's praying this prayer. He's offering this sermon 
to his, his himself and then to his disciples and now to thousands who are around him. A beautiful mountain. If you haven't been there, you ought to go. The mountain of Beatitudes. It's a beautiful mountain full of green grass and flowers. A beautiful, peaceful place. What better place to hear Jesus tell us how to pray? It was quite shocking to those hearing it for the first time. God is your father? Never heard that before. But Jesus is truly at a role in the whole uh, chapter of Matthew, that, Matthew 5 that we read in the last couple of weeks. In chapter 6, uh, turned notions of happiness and morality upside down when he said, Blessed are those, blessed are you who are wealthy? No. Blessed are those who are healthy? No. Blessed are those who are struck persecuted, grieving, and generally trodden down. Blessed are you who feel like the world has given you a rough road because the blessings come from the kingdom from the Father above. Our acts are not considered moral when we do, not, when we do the right thing while overcoming our desire to do the wrong thing. Our acts are considered moral when we do the right thing precisely because that's what we desire to do. Now, Jesus enters into a prayer in which he seems to be continually praying for God to return, for God's name to be hallowed, God's will be done, and God's kingdom come. Praying constantly for God's kingdom to come and intervene with what's going on in this old world of ours. And he prays for strength to carry out the commands. He wants his disciples to listen to what he's got to say because he knows he will not be with us much longer in the flesh. Therefore, if this is to carry on, and you are to be the sons and daughters of the Father Almighty, God, who's Father, then you have to carry on and while I'm gone. And he says, we are to forgive the debtors rather than being vengeful. Forgive those who debt, whose debts are owed to me. Forgive those who have sinned against me. Forgive those who have trespassed against me. You can use debts or just trespasses or sins. Those are three different words in the scripture. But probably the best one for us to use today would be sins. Let me forgive those who sinned against me. Who sinned against you? How do you forgive sins for somebody who's done you wrong? If there's any doubt about the revolutionary nature of these teachings, we have only to glance ahead at the end of the sermon where Matthew adds the, the crowds, Matthew 7, 28 through 29, We'll read that next week as we finish this up. The crowds were astounded at his teachings, for he taught as one having authority, not as the scribes. The scribes never thought of themselves as having authority. They just taught the law. And Jesus taught as if he had the authority. This is my father, and it's your father. Listen to what I'm saying. Jesus is doing more than repeating tradition in his sermon. And most shocking is that he seems to think he's God. He said, I am human and I am spiritual. I am God. I am human. Nobody ever said they were that. But this is God come down from heaven to teach us the way of life. The followers are not God, but are being sent out like sheep into the midst of wolves, Matthew 10, 16, to be witnesses to a rough and sometimes unforgiving world. And that's where we come in today. This sermon was given to his disciples and those who followed him 2,000 years ago. But it's a sermon even for us today. We are living in a rough and unforgiving world, but we are supposed to not give an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, not look at somebody else and judge them for what they've done when I haven't looked at myself for what I have done or haven't done I should have done. Jesus is under no illusion that the things he is calling followers to do will be easy. He never says it's an easy road. Come and follow me. It's a piece of cake. He said it's tough. You're in a tough world. An unforgiving world, a world that doesn't understand God as your father. But when you understand God as your father, you will surprise the world by going out into the world and forgiving others who have sinned against you. You will not judge those. You will not do anything but seek the father who is in heaven. So is it little surprise that Jesus also teaches his disciples how to pray in the sermon. The disciples will need strength to witness faithfully. Prior to his death, Jesus sees clearly the need for committal and communal institutional support and pledges to build his church upon Peter. Thou art Petros, Pedros, thou art Peter, and upon you, upon this rock, I will build my church. Peter was thought to be the one that would carry on when Jesus died. 
And the witness of God given by the other disciples was there as well. Help build this church. After Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, Christ's physical presence will be no longer. He will be gone. But the Holy Spirit will come down and be upon you and will help you to build the church and will help you to uh, uh, go against those who revile you, go against you, and persecute you. Jesus shows that in order to continue this witness, there's another thing required of the disciples and of you and of me. They will need to draw strength from the divine. They'll have to do it in secret sometimes. And so we hear those words, pray in secret. What does that mean? It doesn't mean your secret society somewhere, but pray where it's quiet, where you're away from the world. In the church is a good place to pray. Come and pray and meditate quietly. And then listen to the word that gets passed down from his disciples to other disciples. Draw your strength from the Holy Spirit that is around you and within you. And so you'll be able to go from this place out into the world and not be afraid to preach the gospel. So many times our character says, yes, I'm going to go out in the world, I'm going to witness, and I'm going to let the world know that I'm at peace with God. And then all of a sudden we get out in the world that's just so different than us, and we conduct ourselves so differently because the world expects us to do that. Private and personal prayer was not new to the disciples. They were faithful Jews, and faithful Jews had private and personal prayers. The Old Testament is full, not only of references to people who prayed devoutly throughout their lives, but also by all kinds of prayers. They had prayers of praise, prayers of lamentations, prayers of petitions for strength and for wisdom, and even blessings of their children. It was the nature of Jesus' prayer in which he shockingly referred to God, not only as his Father, but your Father. Pray to God, your Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be his name. We can tell from later passages that listeners were already shocked by the authority that Jesus assumed. And now he's calling God Father and having called us to be followers and call God Father as well, bringing all of us along for the trip as adopted children through faith and faith alone, that we can come along as God's children and that we are to pray this prayer or at least pray something like this. As you go to pray, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven and so forth. We are to pray that prayer along our journey, not just once, not just twice, but every day of our lives. It's led us some part of this tradition and dubbed this passage the Disciples' Prayer, but not just the capital D, Disciples, the 12 that followed him, but the disciples, you and me and everybody who calls themselves Christians, we are to follow that prayer along life's journey. After all, we are the ones who will be praying it. We are the ones who stand not only in constant need of God's power and grace, but also in need of continuous reminder of our need, especially in light of our status as post-ascension people. We can be assured that we are indeed given this grace and given this power. And given the grace and the power through the Holy Spirit, we can go out in the world and not be afraid Forgive us our debts, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Don't fight the people who revile against you, but go in peace and tell them that God be with you. They may not understand it, but you do. We can assure and be assured that we are indeed given the grace and the power to withstand all evil. I've been blessed through my own confusion about prayer as a young boy and now as a grown up. It has served to motivate me to teach that prayer. Whatever else you do, pray the Lord's Prayer. I so often didn't do that growing up. I would pray for what I wanted, what I thought I needed, but I forgot to pray our Father who art in heaven. And over the years, I'll go back to the scripture. Jesus said, as often as you pray, pray that prayer. It served to motivate me to teach that prayer to my own children and to others, rather than having a mix-up push, push me away from this permanently. Since turning the other cheek applies to parenting and behavior among siblings as well as adults in complex relationships, my family and many like us find the prayer to be a vital part of our daily life. For children and adults, it's all there. Identifying ourselves like Jesus does as God's children. Wherever I go, I want people to know that I am a child of God. Secondly, ask God to forgive forgiveness of our debts, our trespasses, our sins. 
not as I have done so against others, but just forgive mine, period. And thirdly, ask for God's deliverance from evil, which doesn't mean that all of us are created in hell. Like I mentioned earlier, that I thought, and a lot of my friends thought, that we're created in sin, and God has to come and save us. We're not created in sin. But the evil, the devil part of life is on one shoulder, while the angel is on the other. And we have every day to decide whether we want to follow the devil or the angel. Whichever, which, whichever is on which shoulder, it doesn't matter. Whichever one you follow will be your God. We're not created in hell. We're created in love. We're created with the Holy Spirit to take, take us through life. Satan is alive and well and will take you if you decide to go that way. But devotion, devotional use of the Lord's Prayer is in line with Jesus' presentation in the Sermon on the Mount and in line with the vision of life presented in the book of Matthew overall. For in Matthew, Jesus gives us a church where we come to be strengthened through prayer. It's our singing and hearing the gospel proclaimed each week. We gather sort of in secret, not much, so much in secret, but in quietness, in these walls, closing out the world, closing out the evil forces and allowing the Holy Spirit to penetrate each of our souls and allowing us to sing the songs that give praise to God, allowing us to pray the prayers that bring us peace and allowing us to hear the scripture that Jesus gave so long ago. You are a child of God. And when you pray, pray like this. Each week, we are to bring the light of God to others here and take it out there, wherever we go. And I want to lead us in prayer, but I will give a couple announcements at this point instead of later, because these announcements have to do with prayer. Our organist is not here this, was not here this morning again because her husband, Don Kemna, has been taken back to the hospital, uh, has some infection of some sort, and is uh, fighting that, so we pray for him. And we pray for Terry Shipman, whose dad passed away either last night or early this morning. And also pray for the wedding Wednesday morning prayer group, which will begin again this Wednesday at 8.15. So if you want to be part of the Wednesday morning prayer group, it picks up again this Wednesday at 8.15. Prayer is an important part of our lives. If it's not, we're no better than the other people out there. Let us pray. It's good to be silent sometimes, oh God. It's time to give you thanks for all that we have in our lives. It's time to thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came in the flesh and gave us the word of the Father who is in heaven and gave us instructions on how to pray to fulfill our Christian duties, our Christian love, our Christian aspirations. We have the character of being a Christian. We need to conduct ourselves accordingly. And so we pray in silence. We pray together as a corporate body of Christ. We pray whenever two or three are gathered together, we know you are there and the Holy Spirit is with us. And so this day, we pray for Don Kemna. Pray for his well-being, that you may give him strength and be with Sharon as she traverses back and forth to take care of him and to worry about him. And we give you thanks for, for Terry, who has been taking care of her father for quite some time now. And he's gone to his peace, and he's at peace with that. And we know that Terry is at peace as well. But yet, we know that a loss is a loss. Be with her and comfort her as she makes preparation to say farewell to her loved one. Be with others who have been in the hospital and now home from there and recuperating at home. Be with others who have family members who have problems and diseases or things that will hold them back. Allow them to feel your cleansing presence. Allow them to feel your grace upon grace and peace upon peace. We pray for them. We thank you for them and pray for for the healing powers upon them. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine art the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen.